We'd like to welcome our listeners to the Bolus Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Bolus. The Bolus Company is Northern New England's largest commercial real estate services firm with offices in Portland, Maine, and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We've been selling and leasing real estate in Maine and New Hampshire since 1975. This podcast is designed to provide insight into Maine's business movers and shakers. And speaking of movers and shakers, I'd like to welcome David Evans Shaw to the Bolus Beat. David was born in 1951. He is a native of New Hampshire, grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire, and attended the University of New Hampshire, where he obtained a BA degree in 1973, with the intention of becoming a writer. In 1976, he earned an MBA degree from the University of Maine. David also went to Harvard Business School Senior Executive Program and served on the faculty of the Harvard Kennedy School as a senior fellow. David has received honorary degrees from Colby College, Bates College, the University of Southern Maine, and the Maine College of Art. David has three adult children by his first wife, Marjorie. Their names are Ben Shaw, Abigail Wark, and Eliza Sandals. David has 12 grandchildren, all living in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. From 2006 to 2015, David was married to actress Glenn Close. In researching for this podcast, I discovered listing David's business ventures would take over four typed written pages. However, to name a few that our listeners in Maine will be familiar with, the following video provides a good overview. For me, over and over again, the greatest opportunities often start with tackling big, seemingly impossible challenges, exploring new ideas, doubting the conventional wisdom, seeking to disrupt the status quo, asking what does great look like, discovering novel insights, looking for new answers. That perspective has helped me and my colleagues build a collection of companies with revenues in the billions of dollars, serving tens of thousands of customers around the world. These businesses include life-saving drugs, new generations of veterinary and human diagnostics, tests for food and water quality, new materials such as laboratory-grown leather, bio-based chemicals and fuels, specialty pharmacy services, scientific software, and several other markets. David, based on the video we've just seen, you've started or invested in companies which have an overriding theme of benefiting the world in one way or another. Is that intentional? Yes, very intentional. Uh, I think a, a beautiful part of human nature is, is how inspired people get and how fulfilled they are by working on worthy ventures, uh, ventures that change the world, ventures that make a difference in the world. And, and also to be on a mission with other people that are like-minded doing the same thing. I like to create experiences, create businesses that are aimed at benefiting the world and attract people that love to do that. I get up every day and go to work with the conviction that we're living in the greatest period of scientific discovery and new knowledge creation in, in history. Right. And, and that that creates a massive array of opportunities to harness that technology to really make a difference in the world. And so most of my ventures are, are aimed at that and, and aimed at people that want to harness that technology to benefit the world in healthcare and other markets. But you're also, I assume, looking to make a profit with these different companies as yes. well. And if you can do both, great, I assume. Yeah. yeah. David, I'm, I'm going to give you the names of companies you have helped build <laughs> and organizations you've been close to. Please tell us a little bit about each company and what motivated you to get into these ventures, okay? Locally, the company that uh, most people associate you with is IDEX. Rich Cummings, who was an early IDEX advisor, said in an interview, he said, I saw, quote, David Shaw took a hustling startup and turned it into a global leader in animal health, end quote. And Terry McGuire, who was also an early IDEX advisor, said in the same interview, quote, because legacy companies of IDEX like Covetris and many others, Portland, Maine is now the veterinary health center of the world, end quote. Uh, tell us how you started IDEX and what it's grown into. Also, IDEX started out as Agritech, I believe, and yeah. why the name change to IDEX? My first job in Maine was working for Governor Longley, and while I was in public service in state government, uh, one of the issues that comes up, as it always does in state government, is economic development. How, right. how can we have more jobs, better jobs, uh, and maybe a different economy in the future than the natural resource 
economy that, that's so traditional in Maine. I, I as a 23 or 24 year old, um, when I listen to the ideas about attracting uh, big companies with tax credits to Maine, I was thinking to myself, this is the golden age of entrepreneurship. Some of us need to create a, a success story in entrepreneurship that will inspire that new economy and that will be fun and profitable. And, and, and you talked about making money. Of course, one of the metrics of success in any business is, is how much value you create for all your stakeholders, mm -hmm. including shareholders. I take that very seriously and, and I think the company's results show that. After state government, I, I helped build a strategy consulting firm in food and agriculture and, and I I, I work with a wide array of companies around the world, which helped me see what great looked like in that sector. I, I, but I was traveling hundreds of thousands of miles a year, and I came back to Maine and, and did what I intended to do, which was uh, start a tech company. I had watched in my consulting days the, the whole new generation of biomedical technology starting to hit human medicine and make a, a big difference in in human medicine, and uh, my idea was to take that same transformative technology and meet unmet needs in, in the world of veterinary medicine. It was a confluence of great new technology that was changing the world, and, and interest in doing that at home here in Maine, and, and, and showing what was possible with a, with a tech company right here showing that some of the things that people like to say that there's no money there's there, the there are talent shortages and things like that are can be excuses uh versus reality and so we we built idex to thousands of people uh without public funding without tax breaks uh and and with people that were very excited uh to work there whether they already lived in maine or they came from from far away. And so you were successful in bringing people into Maine. Yes. Um, and originally you wanted IDEX on the waterfront, is that true? IDEX started on the waterfront. Uh, when you're recruiting people to Maine, it's, it's, it's sort of what a lot of people imagine. Or when customers travel from Japan or Europe or something to see you, they, they sort of imagine that you'll be in a setting that is quintessential Maine. And, and so the waterfront was important for that. The company's name was Agritech then, but as we as we evolved beyond the agricultural applications of, of uh, technology in the company, uh, Agritech wasn't the right name anymore. So we, a, a, a core technology for what became IDEX is, is so-called immunodiagnostic. So it's using immunochemistry to create a whole new generation of diagnostic tests. Mm -hmm. The term Im, immunodiagnostics help us derive IDEX. So DX is to diagnostics what RX is to pharmaceuticals. Oh, interesting. So I, we got as far as IDX, and then we turned it into a word and said, we, we had a company culture that, that said that we wanted to be two times as good as our nearest competitors. We wanted to be the best in the world what we did, and, and we had a 2X award in the company, so we added a second X to reflect that, that philosophy of competitiveness and, and being the best in the world at what you do. And how many employees would you say uh, IDEX has now, worldwide? I think it's over 6,000. A lot of people. Yeah. And so, so you really have had a huge impact on Maine through that one company, and we're gonna talk about a lot of others as well. I think so. I, it, it's been important in its own right, but it, it's also important as, a, as an example of what's possible. And it's certainly not the only example of what's possible. There, are, there are, there's a whole generation of, of uh, technology entrepreneurs who have done really impressive things as well. IDEX was my effort to create an example that shows what's possible uh, to inspire uh, future entrepreneurs and not let the struggle and the difficulty and the 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 all the obstacles that get in your way of building a great company to to not let those stop you, to persist and struggle and succeed. Which you've done. <laughs> right. 
You know, David, another company people in Maine associate you with, uh, and rightfully so, is Covetris. This was started by you and your son, Ben. I was looking at the far bigger market for animal pharmaceuticals, for veterinary pharmaceuticals. So diagnostics was small, veterinary pharmaceuticals was huge, and, and we looked for a way when I was at IDEX to get involved in pharmaceuticals, and we did a little bit. So I left. IDEX and, and did a bunch of other things, which I think we'll talk about. I taught at the Kennedy School. I built uh, several biopharma companies with, with uh, other teams. And, and finally, I kept in touch, though, with veterinary medicine. And veterinarians were saying, can you help us with this much bigger problem, which is veterinary clinics are small, complex businesses. And about a third of their revenues comes from selling, from dispensing uh, drugs and uh, specialty diets and other things and you'd never expect to go to your doctor and have them at the as you're checking out give you your drugs or maybe right. a specialty diet or some other uh, product uh, in veterinary medicine is different uh, veterinary clinics do all those things and so these uh, veterinarians were saying to me and and to some associates including Ben that could we solve that problem for them? Could it? Could we? Could they maybe outsource that big part of their business uh, to someone who could do it better? And that's exactly what uh, first Vets First Choice did, which is the company that we built to um, be the provider of services to veterinary clinics, so that we could do home delivery instead of getting your your goods right. at checkout. Uh, and, and that we could find gaps in care and provide better medicine for patients. So the, on the home delivery, though, my understanding is when you get it home delivered, it comes from it, uh, the packaging that has the your veterinarian's name on it. That's right. Right. So it's called white labeled in the name of the veterinarian. All right. So it really comes from Covetris, uh, but uh, it's on behalf of the, right. the vet. To, to get the time sequence right, it came from Vets First Choice, yeah. which was the innovator there based on the Portland waterfront. Vets First Choice uh, created a massive innovation that allowed for home delivery and, and much better management of prescriptions that, that veterinarians write for drugs. Customers were better off, pet owners were better off, veterinarians were better off, they were very happy. It was better medicine and, and better customer satisfaction. The, the people disadvantaged by this business model were the, the distributors that were bringing goods to veterinary clinics sure. so that they could be dispensed out the front door. Right. We were disrupting that business. The biggest distributor of that kind in, in, a, in America, maybe the biggest in the world, was Henry Schein Animal Health. Interesting. Okay. And so we were disrupting their business. They were watching this innovation, and we, you know, we live in a disruptive world where Many business models are getting disrupted all the time. In this case, uh, this distributor was finding that it was uh, losing revenues uh, to a better business model that customers like better. So they called us one day and I knew them quite well because I had used them at IDEX. And so they called and said, um, maybe we should combine forces because we see that what you're doing is the future of veterinary medicine. You're still small. You're several hundred million in revenues, we're four billion in revenues. We have a supply chain in 100 locations in 25 countries. And, and maybe if we combine forces, the combination of our uh, logistics and our supply infrastructure and our vendor relationships with your disruptive technology w would be, would, would transform the future of veterinary right. medicine. So yeah. we did Combine that. forces. And then when you did, is in fact that's uh, Covetris now the largest company in Maine, publicly traded company in Maine? I don't, uh, someone else would be better, better person to ask authoritatively about that. But it de depends on whether you're measuring in terms of revenues or market cap. In terms of revenues? Yeah, revenues. Yeah, it's, it's over four billion in revenues. Sure. We, we couldn't keep the Henry Schein name because the parent company for Henry Schein Animal Health is also called Henry Schein. And, and it would be confusing to the marketplace if we kept that name. The Henry Schein people th thought of Vets First Choice as a little, little disruptive company, and they said maybe we could come up with a new name. And so we, we came up with the, 
the name Covetris, which is now highly recognized around the world as a as a leader in new technology to change the future of veterinary medicine. In a very short period of time. Mm. I mean, just two or three years, right? Yeah. Amazing. You know, David, uh, another organization that your uh, people uh, listening to this uh, and watching this video will know is uh, Jackson Laboratories. And you've been very involved with them uh, over the years. What was your involvement with them? And tell us a little bit about Jackson Lab up there. And sure. Well, their means best most prestigious uh, scientific institution. They're the world leaders in mammalian genetics. I'll, maybe I'll relate this a little bit to the, the technological megatrends that were driving IDEX and driving Covetris and driving dramatic change in the whole technology world. One of the most stunning and remarkable of those is, is in our lifetimes, the discovery of DNA, the sequencing of the mm -hmm. human genome in 2000. And, and, and the whole world of genetics and genomics. As it happens, in 1929, a researcher that had uh, ties to Columbia University uh, also had a connection to Maine, and he decided to build a little research laboratory in Bar Harbor uh, called the Jackson Laboratory, named after one of the original funders, um, Roscoe B. Jackson. It, it, was a, it was the very early days of genetics before we even knew about DNA, which, which we understood the structure of DNA in the 50s. I happened to uh, do a lot of consulting work for General Mills in Minneapolis when I was in the, con the ag food consulting business, and I met their CEO. Their CEO was a, a wonderful guy named uh, Robert Kinney. He had some connections to Maine. He grew up in Maine. He, he at the time I was working with him, he. He was on the board of Unum and Hannaford and Bates College, where he went to school. He joined the IDEX board, and he asked me to come with him one day to his house in Bar Harbor and see the Jackson Laboratory, which I'd heard about. I was stunned that, that I had never, as a resident of Maine, with a lot of connections in the biomedical world, that I had never really heard much about Jackson. Bob asked me to join the board, and I did. I'll just say a little bit of technical things. Is you can you can sequence a gene and you can you can see a gene like what, like we did in the human genome sequencing process in 2000, but to find out what that gene does, uh, you you have to have it an animal model, and so the mouse is the animal model for that. So if you change a gene. Um, which is called a genotype, if you have a certain gene, you need to know what the phenotype is, which is the expression of that gene somewhere in an animal, in a human, or whatever. The Jackson Laboratory is, is, a, is a stunningly important resource globally for understanding um, what the, the relationship between genes and what genes code for, the, the phenotype, the traits that the gene codes for. So I uh, headed a development effort. Uh, I'm going to say, unfortunately, one day there was a fire at the lab set, set by a welder. And, and I was uh, on a search committee to find a new director who was visiting us from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, the fire happened, as, as Ken Pagan was his name, had gone back to Bangor Airport. Uh, we called, we paged Ken and said, please come back. There's been a fire. We need you now. The, the crisis of that fire transformed the Jackson Laboratory. We, we got insurance proceeds. Ken Pagan took over as chairman. George Mitchell and I and others uh, raised what amounted to about $70 million uh, to uh, create an exponential change in the, the ability of the Jackson Laboratory to create value in the world. Mm -hmm. It's now 90, more than 90 years old, and it went from 10 or 15 million in revenues in those in those early days when I first visited to over 250 million in revenues now. It's a it's a stunningly important resource. And you were chairman the of the board at one time. I was chair, I've been on the board for 30 years now, and I was chairman of the board during those times of exponential change, yeah. recruiting a new director, um, of building another site in Connecticut and Sacramento, California. Yes. And Ed Lou is the president now. Ed, Ed Lou is, is a fantastic, has been a fantastic leader. He announced his retirement and he may be gone 
or, but he's certainly leaving soon. Uh, I remember a dinner we had at your house, and mm -hmm. I sat next to Ed Lou, and the, the man's brilliant. And yeah. he was telling me about how they can take a tumor that might be in a human, yeah. put it on a mouse, and then see how whatever treatment is being applied affects a mouse so that yeah. they can then later go back and put it in a human. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Um, and the reason for using the mouse is that the life cycle is so much quicker, you can see the results in that mouse right. in maybe a month or two months versus if you did it with a human, it would take years. Right, and they have 90-something percent the same genes as humans do, right. expressed differently. But the, the, the founder was working on fruit flies in, the, in, the, in around 1920 at, at Columbia, and it was the founder of, of the Jackson Laboratory, uh, Clarence C. Little, who decided to make the change from studying genetics and fruit flies to uh, mice as an experimental model. Well, last question on uh, Jackson Labs, if, if you know the answer. Why did the founder place it in uh, Maine, in particular in, in Mount Desert? He was uh, at the University of Maine at the time. It was, it was near where he was at the University of Maine. It was a beautiful place, and, and, and there were uh, donors there. Edsel Ford was a friend of Roscoe Jackson's, okay. and so they both put the original funds into the laboratory, and, it, and then Roscoe Jackson died, and that's why it was called the Roscoe B. Jackson Memorial Laboratory. But it was, it was a, a, a confluence of the founder was nearby, uh, the site was beautiful, and, and there were willing donors. David, a num number of other companies to talk with you about that you've been involved with. Um, let me rapid fire some of these. I Icaria. Icaria is a, is a company where I, I'm the founding CEO and, and chair of the board uh, based in New Jersey, and we had the opportunity to commercialize a an amazing drug called inhaled nitric oxide that saves the lives of hundreds of people a year. Without getting into the technical details, it dilates blood vessels, specifically in the lungs. So it's called a so-called pulmonary specific vasodilator mm -hmm. that can save people's lives when they can't oxygenate their blood. I commercialized that and built a sizable, incredibly motivational, inspiring, and, and rewarding company that was also very profitable. Uh, in a fully integrated pharmaceutical company, and then uh, the company was sold to Mallinckrodt, who also, we, we were a so-called critical care uh, company, and if you went to the neonatal intensive care unit at Maine Medical Center, you'd find our products used there in critical care. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mallinckrodt had a big critical care company, so they were anxious to add it to their business. Modern Meadow. So, while I was uh, building Icaria, um, I used some consulting resources to look at the at other opportunities in critical care. Uh, one of these was a McKinsey consultant uh, named Andres Forgox, who uh, used to stay late after we worked and talk about his uh, wishes to be an entrepreneur instead of a consultant. And he would tell me about his ideas, and one of those ideas turned into what's now called Modern Meadow. So the idea was that we live in a time in the world where we can make things in laboratories that are made in nature. And of course, pharmaceuticals are like that in, in a way. Uh, but his idea was that uh, leather, the, the skin of animals that's, that's that's a big market around the world and that, that has, where there are a lot of issues with consumers who don't like to use leather, or don't right. like to wear leather, or they're against uh, uh, issues associated with, with animal consumption and animal products, uh, that we could essentially make that leather in a laboratory. So I became an, a, a, an advisor, a friend, a founding investor, and, a, and an original board of directors member for a company called Modern Meadow that, that now is producing leather that's grown in a laboratory. So you actually grow leather? It's called in the press growing leather, but it's, it's not a secret that it, and in fact, it's a, it's a product of fermentation. Uh, we, we, if you want kangaroo leather or you want woolly mammoth leather, 
uh, we can put the cells that make the collagen, which is the biggest right. uh, constituent of skin, and uh, we can, through fermentation, produce recombinant collagen that's species specific. And, and can you do it on a scale that's commercially viable? Yes. yes. So our my, you know, if I look in my closet tonight and I with my shoes, are some of those possibly from this product? Not yet. Soon. Soon. Yeah. It's it's also it's also spawned a whole world that we call biofabrication, where where things are being made out of mushrooms, and and things are being made out of of, of other substances. Uh, there's spider silk that's now made in laboratories. Uh, there are, as you know, there's there's uh, meat that that's that's made synthetically, and so there's a whole new world called biofabrication, and we are a part of that. The luxury brands around the world that that uh, pay a lot for uh, animal leather, kangaroo leather, whatever, they're very anxious to have a new material. They very seldom have new materials, and and so we have. Uh, created a lot of interest in what uh, our product is called ZOA, Z-O-A. And so uh, you can expect to see ZOA showing up in wallets, in handbags, in shoes, in watch straps, in many other things. And I would imagine because it's made, it's probably p perfect. There aren't imperfections in it, unlike it, regular it animal be, skin. It, it's interesting. A, a, a material created like this can to some extent be whatever you want it to be, whatever you imagine it to be in terms of, of uh, tensile strength, in terms of color, in terms of uh, waterproof capabilities and, and other things. So you can add capabilities and, and uh, attributes to this product that, that are harder to do in nature. Amazing. Uh, Satir, Maxwell, Cytex, Ovation, are they uh, related or? They're related in the sense that, that the, uh, the mission that they're on is inspirational to me and others. Uh, the people that are involved are, are very capable. There's, I like to use the word tribal when I think about the teams that, that are associated with these companies, IDEX, Covetris. It's a tribal life enriching experience to be part of some of these companies. And the more interesting the mission, uh, and I'll talk about site here next, uh, the, the more, the, the easier it is to assemble an extraordinary team of talent to take on this audacious goal and do something that, that's never been done before. So mm -hmm. Citeer is a uh, cancer therapy company, an oncology company that I first heard about wandering the, the halls of the Jackson Laboratory. A senior scientist named Kevin Mills said he had an idea. And this is common when you go to a university, there are scientists with lots of ideas and they wonder about their commercial uh, opp opportunity, the, the way to convert this amazing science into something that benefits the world. So he uh, told me a story about how he thought he could induce mass suicide in cancer cells through a mechanism that he had discovered and he's protected in the Jackson Laboratories, protected via patents. I helped uh, then create uh, Citeer, uh, was, was the founding investor and advisor, and uh, the, the company has filed to go public now. Uh, it's in phase two clinical trials with a very promising oncology drug. And that drug, if successful, would put into a person, kill, uh, cancer cells, all, of, all in mass? That's the intention. Uh, you know, going back to genetics, every human is different. Uh, every, our, our genetics are all very different. Right. And so uh, pr predicting exactly what will happen takes a lot of trials, which is, sure. which is the, the, the journey that we're on right now at CITER is to go, go through trials to prove a claim uh, that, that is believed to be valid by the FDA. And that's a long process normally, correct? Yeah, we have a couple more years. Ovation, that's here in Portland, isn't it? Yeah, and, and Ovation, Ovation is related to what we just talked about in a way, or a few things that we've talked about. So Ovation is a, is a company that does uh, specialty diagnostics to combine clinical data, so the kind of data you'd get if you went to a lab and you had blood work done, 
you would combine that clinical data with genomics data. Now, when the human genome was sequenced just uh, 20 years ago, it, it was, a, I don't know the exact cost, maybe let's say hundreds, tens of millions of dollars, maybe $100 million to do that first sequence. Uh, now it costs, th then, it, then it dropped to tens of million, $10 million and $1 million, and now it's, 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 it's just a thousand, or, or it's, it's very inexpensive to do a gene sequence uh, on a sample. So we at, at Ovation can combine uh, genomics in information about an individual with their clinical information, and, and those two data sets combined is the first time we've ever been able to do this. And, and, it, and it's the underpinnings that are needed to launch what is often referred to as precision medicine. So precision medicine, instead of being able to say with a drug or some treatment regime that this might work on you based on what we know about you, uh, we're entering an era where we, we know exactly, we know more about you and, and we can precisely target a therapy uh, to work for you. And, mm -hmm. and that is what is, is the work that's being done at Ovation, which is on Commercial Street. Isn't that amazing, right here in Portland? Yes. Agribusiness Associates? When I worked in the Longley administration, I, I had a lot of responsibility for natural resources, for uh, marine resources, forestry, uh, and agriculture. And, and, and so I learned a lot about that, uh, and, but I also looked for some help from people outside of Maine that, that could, could help us formulate a strategy for success in those businesses in Maine, in those sectors in Maine. Uh, one of those was a Harvard Business School professor named Ray Goldberg, wh whose domain was food and agriculture, mm -hmm. so the business of food and agriculture. Uh, Ray and I got to know each other quite well in, in those interactions. And uh, we, together with some others, built a, a strategy consulting firm called Agribusiness Associates that had clients around the world that we helped to figure out issues in the grain economy, the protein economy, the citrus economy, fruits and vegetables, uh, even energy derived from agriculture, ethanol from corn. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we ran around the world as experts in food and agriculture, and I learned a lot about that. One of our clients uh, became a, a consortium of the world's largest agricultural banks in Europe called Credit Agricole, DG Bank, and Rabobank. So these are farmer banks, agricultural banks in Europe, and they were a client, and then they said, we would love to own you. So they acquired Agribusiness Associates, and that's when I started IDEX. Venrock Associates. So Venrock um, is, is in, in my agribusiness days, I had some interaction with them. That is the, uh, historically, that's the venture capital arm of the Rockefeller family. Uh, a few years ago, they also took funds from other sources. So it's, it's not strictly a family office anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, so Venrock Associates is, is a renowned, venture capital firm uh, based in New York, but with offices around the country, uh, who have, have funded an amazing array of great companies in the tech world. Uh, Apple Computer, Intel, uh, Eastern Airlines, uh, the list goes on and on, Biogen, IDEX. So when, okay. <laughs> when, when I needed funding for IDEX, uh, I, had gotten to know, I'd actually done some work for another arm of the Rockefeller family. Uh, they, they, one arm of the Rockefeller family owned something called Arbor Acres, the world's leading poultry genetics firm. And, and I helped them, Ray Goldberg was on their board, I helped them buy a Nicholas Turkey Farm and, and, and get into aquaculture and other things. So I had gotten to know the family and one day I said, look, I, I wanna stop writing reports and being a consultant for a living and, and get on the other side of the desk and, 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 and run a business and, and be the entrepreneur. So they, they uh, funded IDEX. Years later, when I left IDEX to go on the faculty of the Kennedy School with David Gergen and others, uh, Venrock asked me to come to New York and be a partner. 
So when I was done my gig at, as a faculty member at the Kennedy School, I went to the 50th floor of 30 Rock and became a partner at Venrock. You talk about IDEX. How old were you when you started IDEX? 31, maybe. And, early 30s. And when did you leave IDEX? At what age? 50, early 50s. Really? Curiosity stream. <laughs> so just like every other sector of, of our, our economy, uh, there's, there's disruptive technology everywhere in travel, in media. And, and, and so uh, I, had, I had become an advisor to the Discovery Channel. I was the treasurer of the world's largest science society in Washington, D.C. at the time. And so I was presiding over a lot of media, uh, including maybe the most prestigious publication in the world of science called Science Magazine. The founder of Discovery, John Hendricks, asked me to be an advisor to Discovery Channel, and we got to be friends, and, and I really enjoyed that work. And then he decided to leave Discovery Channel because the cable industry was maturing, and, and there was more disruptive technology coming in, and that, that disruptive technology, one of those is called streaming. So we know about streaming now from Netflix and uh, Disney and other people. John wanted to, to be in the streaming world. And, and I would say there was an analogy to me wanting to leave IDEX and, and do kind of the next big thing, the next really adventurous, exciting thing. So I joined John and helped create Curiosity Stream, including Curiosity Retreat. So Curiosity Retreat happens uh, out in Colorado and, and uh, some of the, I helped organize some of the sessions at Curiosity Retreat that were, uh, that were uh, videotaped, that were filmed. Some of, some of the sessions that were filmed and then became content on the streaming channel called Curiosity Stream. And was there, we talked before the taping, uh, a movie that was you were involved with through this company, or perhaps it was one of the other companies? Well, they have thousands of titles on that channel now. And uh, yes, they have some titles, they have, they have some content that I developed. And other content that I facilitated by, by being a presenter with, for example, Sylvia Earle. I, I brought Sylvia Earle to Curiosity Retreat. We talked about the, the um, the health of world oceans and, and that the film made of that session became content on Curiosity Stream. I know you've been involved with the National Park Foundation. And in fact, I believe you were uh, inducted into the Teddy Roosevelt uh, Society. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was, I was very flattered to be approached about uh, joining the National Park Foundation so I, it was a six-year presidential appointment uh, to join this foundation with, with uh, a group of very interesting people around America who uh, try to help the National Park Service uh, as a supportive foundation. And it just happened that the year that I was appointed, that, that my last year would be the National Park Centennial in 2016. So I was appointed in 2010. So much of our work for the six years that I was uh, on the board was preparing for this amazing 100-year celebration of the creation of the National Park Service. So uh, we raised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. On my last meeting with the National Park, as a director of the National Park Foundation, I arrived a little bit early at the site, which happened to be uh, the, the historic park Sagamore Hill National Historic Site, Teddy Roosevelt's home. And so I showed up and I was the first person there and an, and an actor in character as Teddy Roosevelt for, for visitors uh, came over and, and uh, greeted me. And, and for, for a few minutes, Teddy and I wandered around his home in the museum there and, and he stayed in character as Teddy Roosevelt telling me his stories. Uh, at dinner, we had, a, we, had, we had a nice dinner and some presentations, and then they announced that they were go going to 
appoint several people to the uh, Teddy Roosevelt Society, and I was one of those. So it's a, it's a great honor for me to have my service to national parks and through the National Park Foundation recognized as a member of the Teddy Roosevelt Society. Uh, very nice. nice. So uh, upon the National Park Centennial, I, like other people, were thinking about what I could do to honor the centennial and also to think about uh, the future of national parks. It, they are a stunningly remarkable uh, source of, of uh, nature, but more, much more than nature. They include the historic monuments in the, the Lincoln Memorial, sure. uh, the Gettysburg, the war monuments, the Gettysburg Monument, and many other things. So we think of them as the Grand Canyon and Acadia National Park, but it's much more than that. It's even the, the Music National Park in, in, uh, uh, that's, that's devoted to jazz in uh, New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So it's a remarkable thing for us to, it, a heritage for us to all have this national park system. And, and as I thought about what I would like to do uh, for the next generation uh, to preserve and protect and honor this amazing gift that we have, I decided that with, with the more than 300 million visitors that go to national parks every year, that if we could, if we could make some of those visits more meaningful, meaningful in the way uh, that I saw some visitors who who uh, did some science exploration while they were in the park. Sometimes they were uh, classrooms with children. They would go into parks and they'd do experiments and they'd, they, they wouldn't just see the beautiful scenery. They, they would ask questions about how did it get here? Um, how does it work? And so there was no unified way of looking at that and I created something called Second Century Stewardship uh, to help turn parks and reimagine parks in the next century as classrooms and laboratories so that they can inspire people about the, the wonder of our natural world as, as well as the history that's documented in the, in the parks. So it, the second century stewardship uh, was piloted in Acadia National Park and it has been very successful there with, with uh, uh, quite a few very highly qualified scientists doing research in the parks that have an impact on policy that involves citizens in what we call citizen science and, and that, that, that are then communicated to the public. So the idea is to have second century stewardship go to all parks and, and impact the next century of America's national parks. And so kids uh, in classrooms come, yes. get bussed in, spend the day in the park with the teacher. Yeah, in, in an ideal world, we we put out a request for proposal and, and try to get the very best proposals we can about interesting projects that can be done in, it could be archaeology or social science or the first one we funded was to, was to look at uh, biodiversity, was to look at biodiversity in national parks using new technology and, and this is related to Jackson Laboratory. The new, t the new way of measuring what kind of biological organisms we have in a park is instead of counting them, counting bugs, counting fish, counting uh, birds or whatever, uh, we can now do uh, DNA testing. And so it's called eDNA for environmental. So we funded a, a program to do eDNA testing in Acadia as, as a, to, to prove a mechanism that could be, be done in every park and build a database of biodiversity across all national parks and even internationally. That's quite an accomplishment, quite mm. a program. The Sargasso Sea Alliance. Sargasso Sea Alliance was conceived of in, in a trip with some colleagues to, to the Galapagos. We were in the Galapagos, uh, a, a dozens of us went there to both dive and learn about the Galapagos, but also to have scientific sessions on our ship uh, about uh, how at this momentous time in history, uh, we, can, we can enhance the health of world oceans. 70% of the surface of planet Earth is oceans. Oceans are very deep versus the, the living space in the terrestrial world. And so when you think about it on a volumetric basis, um, 
in, in cubic miles or whatever, uh, oceans are the biggest uh, living ecosystem on Earth. Mm -hmm. Most of world oceans are ungoverned. So uh, back in the 1970s, just before I worked for uh, Maine State Government, the, the jurisdiction of nations w only went out a couple of miles. Uh, then, then the jurisdiction of nations was, was changed through international law to 200 miles. And so every country uh, in the world now has jurisdiction of, of its marine ecosystems 200 miles from land. Mm -hmm. The oceans beyond that, beyond national jurisdiction, are, are often called the high seas. And there is no uh, great governance, there's no great stewardship of those, of, of those oceans, which constitute most of planet Earth. So uh, we thought we would do an experiment uh, with these high seas and, and travel to Bermuda, which sits in the middle of what's known as the Sargasso Sea, mm -hmm. which is a several million square mile gyre, kind of a, a, a swirling gyre of, that's characterized by floating sargassum seaweed. And most of that is high seas, is, is not governed by any country. Mm -hmm. It's beyond the jurisdiction of any country. Because Bermuda was in the, in the midst of it, we asked the Prime Minister of Bermuda and, and other Bermudians to work with us to come up with the first ever framework for protecting high seas. And we did that. We succeeded in getting now 14 countries to be signatories to a declaration that we created for the protection of this 2 million square miles of high seas surrounding Bermuda. Is the hope to get all the countries who have uh, an interest in the seas to sign off on that? We, we have most of the major countries now. Yes, the intention would, would be to have everyone who's adjacent to it or that, that maybe has ships or, uh, or fishing ships or any, anything that travels through the Sargasso Sea, if they have an interest in, a, in the Sargasso Sea, we'd like them to become signatories mm -hmm. to the declaration. And lastly, in terms of questions about the many companies and, and uh, nonprofits and profits you're involved with, the Aspen Institute High Seas Initiative. Can you tell us about that? So the Sargasso Sea Alliance was an experiment in protecting open oceans, these areas beyond na national jurisdiction. Uh, my intention and the intention of my colleagues, including a, a renowned marine scientist named Sylvia Earle, was to uh, take the successful model developed it, and, and the awareness, the global awareness of the need to protect high seas was, was then to take it to all of the high seas on the planet. We created a high seas alliance uh, to uh, find stakeholders, and in this case, particularly the United Nations, to create a framework to protect uh, all of the high seas on the planet as a marine reserve. Uh, because it's so important and, be, and because every country that's adjacent to these high seas uh, relies on the health of the high seas for the health of their territorial waters, their, mm -hmm. their inshore waters. And so the first thing that I did uh, was lead the effort to get the United Nations to appoint a special envoy for oceans so that within the United Nations there was a point person uh, that would know uh, what's going on in the complexity of all the deliberations that happen all over the world in the United Nations. So the Fiji ambassador to the United Nations, uh, a, a guy named Peter Thompson, took that job and I funded that job along with some colleagues, including uh, Prince Albert and others in, in Europe. So we, that was one thing. And then now we're working with Peter Thompson and ourselves to to find mechanisms that are acceptable to the world community of countries and nations to uh, protect the high seas. Congratulations, that's a, a worthy cause, no doubt. <laughs> it's a, you, you can't think of a bigger environmental project than that one. We've been speaking with businessman and serial entrepreneur David Shaw. We had so much to cover, we've decided to break this into two parts. This is the end of part one. Part two follows shortly. David, I want to thank you for being our guest today on the Bolus Beat, a Bolus company podcast. 
I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. You can learn more about David and his many accomplishments at his company's website, which is www.blackpointgroup.com. Well worth checking out. And if you'd like to learn more about the Bolus Company, please be sure to visit us at www.bolus.com. You can also find us at the Bolus Company on Facebook and LinkedIn and at the Bolus Co. on Instagram and Twitter. And lastly, if you want to know the secret to owning real estate, it's pretty simple. Just be sure to outlive your debt. Thanks for tuning in.